So I'm going to be building upon what Dr. Chase started with and the deluge of information we're potentially going to get in this time in the letter, forms of letters of A's, T's, C's, and G's. So I'm far from perfect. I might wish I were perfect, but my husband reminds me on a daily basis how far I am from perfect. <laughs> And from a genetic point of view, I can tell you that I, as well as you, have mutations or mistakes from anywhere from about five to 15 genes that you have. Some of these genes will predispose us to things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer. Some of us will actually predispose our children to potentially have severe and even potentially lethal disorders. In other words, we come to the table with genes that both make us brilliant in some dimensions, but also in other dimensions really susceptible to things that could be very, very serious for us. On the other hand, serious medical problems that in many cases are preventable. In other words, that it's not all just about genetic determinism, but that there are actually things that we can do to be able to prevent, to mitigate, to be able to ameliorate some of those things that might be in our genetic cards in the future. Over the last two years, I personally have seen a remarkable change in what genetic diagnostics can do for my patients. As a clinical geneticist, I take care of many patients, in large part, a large number of children that come to me having searched for a diagnosis, in many cases for months, in many cases for years, in some cases for decades. Individuals who knew that there was something wrong, yet they could not find an answer to what that was. One of the things that's been wonderful yet frustrating is over the last two years with the ability now to actually read through our entire genome, read through our six billion base pairs of A's, T's, C's, and G's, now for the first time in many of those cases, I can actually come up with definitive genetic diagnoses that both tell me what the prognosis is as well as tantalizingly tell me what the treatment is. I've now taken care of children where I've been able to make their diagnoses and come up with treatments and cures that include things like bone marrow transplant, liver transplant, and in certain cases, changes in diets or additions of metabolic factors that could have, could have, had I known about them in the beginning, prevented a lot of the pain and suffering that they have gone through. And so, in fact, one of the questions becomes, if I had known this from the very beginning, if I had known this from the time that those children, those patients had been born, would have I been able to change the outcome? Would I have been able to actually make a difference, be able to prevent much of the pain, the suffering, the mental retardation that they have suffered as a fact of this? So in fact, this is not a new idea. Starting in 1963 was the first time that we actually, as a public health initiative, started newborn screening. This was done with a disease called phenylketonuria, was done with the idea that a very simple modification of diet, removing or at least greatly reducing the amount of phenylalanine in the diet, could prevent irreversible brain damage from these children. And in fact, that was the initiation of this project, uh, this public health infrastructure to do this. And as you can see, this is actually done now on every single baby born, not just in the United States, but in fact, most babies worldwide at this point. These simple heel sticks with collection of these uh, blood spots allow us to be able to uh, diagnose these conditions before they become symptomatic at a time when we can intervene with an effective outcome. I am going to put forth a proposal to you that one could think about greatly expanding this program so that it is not simply a newborn screening program for two or three or four dozen disorders, but potentially hundreds to thousands of disorders. If you could make these diagnoses at the one time where everyone passes through the medical system, where everyone has a chance, has access to this technology, where you could do it in a cost-effective manner, how much of our disease burden could we actually ameliorate and how much uh, disease could we prevent? So this is what's happened to the newborn screening program over time. With empowering technologies, and that's what's happened in the uh, 2008, 2009 of tandem mass spectroscopy, we saw a remarkable increase in the number of disorders that we could effectively screen for literally small numbers of additional dollars, a total of $50, for instance, in New York State. If this could be done cost effectively, and right now the price tag for doing that would be about $1,000 per person, certainly not inexpensive at this point, but if this could be done cost effectively and most important, accurately, would this be a worthwhile investment again with a great expansion of the newborn screening program? In fact, predictions are that this will get to the point where in fact it is much less than a dollar, or $1,000, excuse me. 
This is what's happened to the cost of sequencing over time on the x-axis, and importantly, this is a logarithmic scale. And what you can see is the cost of sequencing has come down tremendously in the year 2007, in particular with the advent of next generation sequencing technology. This cost is continuing to come down, and with the advent of additional next, next generation sequencing technologies that are on the horizon, is going to come down to a point that I would argue very soon is actually going to be affordable to implement from a public health point of view. So as I will argue again, there is a remarkable opportunity in the sense that we have the public health infrastructure available to do this. And as Dr. Chase was saying, importantly, and simultaneously with the ability and the development with electronic medical records with decision support so that you can put that six billion base pairs into the back end of an electronic medical record with the interpretation that evolves and emerges over time as our knowledge and understanding of this emerges over time and now with the ability to integrate that with decision support so that doctors, when they need to make decisions in real time about a medication, whether someone is going to have an adverse reaction to that medication, whether that, just as Dr. Chase was saying, combination of medications, but in that individual person with that genetic susceptibility, is this now our opportunity to actually make the healthcare system to make ourselves smarter in a way with those machines learning and supporting us when we can actually implement all of that? And I would argue, we are coming to, we are not there yet, but we are coming to a time when that becomes possible. Why would we think about doing this? I would argue we wouldn't think about doing this for everything, but when we start thinking about disorders which are treatable, preventable, where early diagnosis makes a difference, this could be tremendously powerful in terms of improving the health of our children in the next generation. Certainly, as I was starting out telling you, there are many families that go on this diagnostic odyssey that look for years and years, many of whom are still looking for a diagnosis, and this could streamline that process. One might not necessarily open up that envelope of those diagnoses immediately at the time of birth, for instance, but when that child then comes to their pediatrician, comes to a subspecialist with symptoms of a problem, immediately able then to push buttons and be able to release and harness that information that was collected at the time of birth in a very cost effective manner. And finally, for these conditions that are genetic, obviously, knowing this information early for parents allows them the option, not that they have to take it, but allows them the option to make informed reproductive decisions about whether or not this would happen again, and whether they'd like to avoid that recurrence. However, <laughs> with this could come a lot of information and a lot of information that one might not want to know, ever, potentially, or perhaps not at least when a baby is initially born in that very complicated time. And so one has to think about this thoughtfully. By knowing about all of this information, by knowing this about yourself, by knowing this about your family, by knowing about this with your children, and importantly, the fact that we are in a dynamic time where we clearly do not understand all of what that DNA encodes, there are particular dangers to avoid, right? We have to be realistic about understanding what we know and what we don't know, communicating what we do know, but saving what we don't know until a time at which we do know that being able to educate the populace about what this means so there's correct understanding and not misinterpretation of what that means, realizing that not everything is genetically determined, but there is the opportunity to actually affect the outcome, and to realize that for some of this information that's not immediately medically actionable for a child, that information may need to stay someplace else for a period of time until it's medically appropriately to release that information. I personally find this incredibly important so that as parents raise children and as that bonding occurs, this is not overcast. You are not living under the cloud of this probability or possibility of what your child might become in developing Alzheimer's 60 years down the road. That's not part of what should be uh, intervening in terms of parent-child uh, bonding and relationships. So one could imagine, actually, as you have these computers that are preloaded with all of this information, with, again, your six billion base pairs of information, that one could figure out ways of iteratively reanalyzing these data over time as we get more information from a scientific point of view, being able to reinterpret, reanalyze those data, and actually release it at times that it's medically appropriate. So release it depending on the age of the individual, releasing it based on the symptoms that occur, releasing it when a medication is going to be prescribed, but it doesn't have have to be an overwhelming deluge of information, for instance, at the time of birth, 
at the time of birth is simply a means at which, those, at which that sample can be collected, at which that initial data can be produced, and in which it can initially be analyzed. And again, if it's done in that specific way, I think could be tremendously powerful in terms of doing this. On the other hand, one could make the argument, if you can do this in a newborn baby, should we be pushing the time clock back? Should we be, in fact, giving parents the opportunity rather than being you know, having a child that's got major disabilities and major genetic problems, should we give them those choices even before they think about conceiving or once they're pregnant? And in fact, in doing so, there are now methods of being able to do non-invasive, excuse me, genetic prenatal diagnosis, where in fact, from a maternal blood sample at 10 weeks of gestation, one can start to read out the fetal DNA, the fetal genes. And then there are also methods of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which allow one to avoid the whole issue of abortion and simply know for parents at the time before conception that they decide they want to have a baby, read out their genes, figure out if there are things that they both might be carriers for that would have a significant risk of recurrence. The important thing to avoid here, though, is Gattaca. So for those of you who haven't seen the movie, the idea behind Gattaca is that there are individuals that have the means, have access to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and that have the valids, have individuals who have been genetically designed, who have been selected for particular traits and selected against certain traits, and the invalids who actually didn't have access to that technology. So if we decide to continue going down this road, which I am not necessarily opposed to the concept of, as a society, we must be very careful to guard against access so that individuals e equitably have access to this technology and that we're very careful about designing and actually prescribing what are true diseases and things with a significant burden as opposed to, for instance, selecting for height, hair color, uh, or gender as traits that might be selected. So, is Gattaca coming? I would argue that in some ways we're already down the road of this happening, at least in the sense that we have the ability, we have the technology, we are gaining the information to be able to do this. But I hope this has been an introduction to a discussion, a public discussion now about thinking about even if the technology is here, even if we can do these things, how should we do them, should we do them, in what way and when should we do them, but do them in a way that is a responsible way to society and to our patients. Thank you.